Hello everyone, Medic Level Up here. We're back again with another video on approach to diagnosis. Today's approach to diagnosis is going to be about a symptom which is the most common cause for patients to come to the emergency department. It is also the most common cause for re-attendances and repeat visits to the emergency department. I've got a lot of information for you. I've got my most appropriate t-shirt on. Let's get started. Today's video is going to be divided into a couple of categories of diagnosis. It is going to be critical, emergent, and non-emergent conditions. We're going to be focusing more on the critical diagnosis. These critical diagnoses is essentially six in number. So you have got acute coronary syndrome, you've got pulmonary embolism, you've got acute aortic syndrome, you've got Borhaf syndrome, you've got cardiac tamponade, and you've got a uh, tension pneumothorax. The other differentials, which are emergent and non-emergent, We'll try to discuss them less in detail, and these can be anything ranging from myocarditis, a simple pneumothorax, a malaria vice tear, all the way to simple pneumonias or chest infections, or even pain radiating or coming from the musculoskeletal chest wall. It's time to take a proper history and then do an examination. I'm a huge fan of the Socrates approach when it comes to taking a pain history. So the first thing we will talk about is the site or the location of the chest pain. When patients describe their chest pain, which is more central, it can either be coming from the heart, the pericardium, or the aorta itself, or even the esophagus. When the chest pain is more towards the periphery, it can either come from the chest wall itself, the muscles, the bones, or the lungs or the pleura. When patients describe that their pain is in a small localized region on their chest, that is most likely going to be somatic chest pain and is less likely going to be coming from a visceral organ. When patients are not really able to describe where their pain is and instead they use their clenched fist or their palm on the front of their chest, this is called a Levine sign and it can signify that it is probably coming from the heart. The second thing to talk about is the onset of the pain. Pain that happens during exertion and it abates with rest can be a symptom of angina. Pain that is happening more at rest, it keeps on progressing, it can be an indicator towards acute coronary syndrome. Pain that is coming because of esophageal perforation can be due to any of these activities, such as straining, vomiting, a bout of laughter, during childbirth, during a seizure, or even weightlifting. Pain that is maximal at the onset with exercise in young patients can be because of acute aortic dissection. Then there's another very interesting thing that the onset of the pain that comes with aortic dissection is extremely sudden and that it is more common in the early hours of the morning, ranging from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. This goes very much in line with the diurnal variations in blood pressure, where we see that populations tend to have higher blood pressures towards the morning and lower blood pressures in the evening. I guess that is one reason for us to have anxiety when we are doing a morning shift in ED as compared to a twilight shift. No, God, please, no, 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 no. Moving on, we're going to talk about the character of the pain. Now, try to get your patients to describe the character or the nature of the pain as best that they possibly can. Give them some options. Is it burning, stabbing, throbbing, aching, ripping, tearing? What's the pain like? When patients describe pain that is more tight, squeezing, a burden on their chest, feels like an elephant is sitting on my chest, maybe even sometimes a dull ache. Women can sometimes describe this pain as a bra that's too tight. This is most likely going to be cardiac pain. Atypical cardiac pain can also present in the form of belching or reflux or indigestion. So be careful with that. People who have aortic dissections will usually say that their pain at the onset was ripping or tearing, and some ethnicities will also describe this as stabbing. This is mainly because, language, because of language differences. When people describe pleuritic pain, they're most likely talking about sharp and stabbing pain. It is very important for you to characterize what pleuritic pain is because it is very important when we talk about pulmonary embolism. And God knows how much time we spend talking about pulmonary embolism. Anyways. Pleuritic pain is pain that is going to make the patient catch its breath when you ask them to take a deep breath. This kind of pain is sharp, it gets worse with breathing, worse with coughing. Think about a Murphy's test, but this time it's not for the gallbladder, it's just for the lungs. Let's keep moving. The next thing in the Socrates is going to be the radiation of the pain. This is very important. Cardiac pain or pain from the pericardium can radiate towards your left arms, 
or right arm, and this has the highest likelihood ratio of it being an acute coronary syndrome. The pain from ACS can also radiate towards your jaw, your neck, your upper abdomen, and even sometimes towards your back. Be wary of patients having aortic dissection because they will complain of pain radiating towards their neck or through and through towards their back, and majority of the times, these people will feel pain in their interscapular region as well. Pain from the esophagus can also radiate towards the left side of your shoulder or left side of your arm as well. After we, do, we talk about radiation, let's talk about the time or the duration of the pain. Pain that brings on, comes up on with exertion and it lasts usually less than 20 minutes and abates with rest, that is one symptom of angina. Pain that is extremely sudden in onset lasts uh, any amount of duration but resolves when they present to the emergency department, that is a pitfall. Don't fall for it. That can easily be an aortic dissection in the making. Patients can be pain-free at the time of presentation to your emergency department. Another thing, another clinical pearl that I want to impart over here is the use of GTN sprays in the emergency departments. A lot of people tend to say that relief from pain from GTN spray is a very good indicator that this is angina. I'm here to tell you that it's not. Uh, esophageal spasm can be relieved with a GTN spray, so it neither rules in anything or rules out anything for you. The next thing is to ask the patient about their associated symptoms. Be very careful about trying to elaborate each single one of these associated symptoms. Now, when a patient has acute coronary syndrome, they can have easily have angina equivalent symptoms. These symptoms are shortness of breath, lightheadedness, vomiting, nausea, and even syncope. Syncope is not only present in acute coronary syndrome, but it is also present in aortic dissection as well. Along with that, it can also present in patients with pulmonary embolism, and that happens around 5-10% to of the time. People with the pulmonary embolism will also have some degree of calf swelling, calf tenderness, shortness of breath, tachypnea, dyspnea, hemoptysis, and maybe even a fever. The next thing is Boerhaave syndrome. In these patients, when they have rupture of the esophagus, there is spillage of the esophageal contents into the mediastinum. They can develop mediastinitis and be septic when they present to the emergency department. The final thing in the Socrates is to identify the exacerbating and relieving factors. Now, this goes without saying that for angina, you have to make a diagnosis based on exertional chest pain, going away with rest, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms such as pain in relation to meal intake, food intake, or relief with food intake as well. Uh, there can be a association with the coughing when the pain is coming from the chest wall itself. The pain can be associated with positional changes of the patient as well. Uh, we all very much know that uh, lying down will make pain worse when there is pericarditis and sitting up will make this pain better. The next section is one which is very important after you take a pain history and that is uh, identifying what kind of risk factors a patient has uh, for a particular disease. We are going to be talking about four conditions. The first one is going to be acute coronary syndrome. So ACS basically has two categories of risk factors that you need to be aware of. Modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Your non-modifiable risk factors are something you can't really do too much about. Your gender, such as, for example, a male gender is more prone to developing acute coronary syndrome, and then your family history. Modifiable risk factors are those risk factors which, which you can do something about. Your smoking history, your alcohol intake, hypercholesterolemia, your sedentary lifestyle, the amount of exercise you do, and the amount of uh, junk you put inside yourself. Don't eat garbage. The next thing we're going to be talking about is pulmonary embolism. There are a lot of factors that can make you prone to developing a pulmonary embolism. These are essentially all your procoagulant states. People who are on combined oral contraceptive medication, hormonal replacement therapy, certain drugs such as atypical antipsychotics. Cancers can make you more prone to developing pulmonary embolism. Patients who have been immobilized for a long duration of time, patients who have recently had surgery are also prone to developing pulmonary embolism. There are a lot of risk factors that can cause a person to have aortic dissection. Hypertension and smoking are going to be at the top of the list. Other conditions such as people who are born with a bicuspid aortic valve, congenital malformations such as the Turner syndrome, connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Louis Dietz syndrome can also cause aortic dissection. Vasculitis such as Takayasu arthritis, infective conditions such as syphilis aortitis, and then hereditary conditions, which is familial thoracic artery aneurysm and dissection, can also cause a dissection. 
Finally, let's talk about a pneumothorax. Now, a primary pneumothorax is something that is going to happen in tall, thin, slim, and lean patients. And then there are secondary pneumothoraxes, which can happen because of other conditions, such as COPD, asthma, bacterial pneumonia, necrotizing pneumonias, pneumocystis geriatri, and there are very rare conditions such as bird hawk dupe syndrome, and then other conditions such as lymphangioleomyomatosis. Risk factors for esophageal ruptures are basically all your types of esophagitis, which are three or four in number. So you've got pill-induced esophagitis, reflux esophagitis, infectious esophagitis, and then eosinophilic esophagitis. Now that we're done with all of these risk factors, let's move on towards the examination on what you need to look for in your patient. So the first thing I like to start off with is taking a look at their observations. Are they tachycardic? Are they bradycardic? Could the tachycardia be because of a pulmonary embolism? Could the bradycardia be because of a right coronary artery, territory, acute coronary syndrome? Is the patient hypertensive? Could it be a signal towards an acute aortic dissection? Are they hypoxic? Again, a indicator towards a pulmonary embolism or a tension pneumothorax. A fever can present with uh, pulmonary embolism as well, so make sure you keep that in the back of your head. Uh, also think of infective conditions as well. It is very imperative to do a cardiac examination followed by a respiratory examination when you are assessing a patient with chest pain. Uh, when it comes to acute coronary syndrome, uh, the cardiac examination is more likely aimed towards prognostication of the patient. You need to find evidence of failure so if there is any crackles in the uh, chest, if there is any third galloping uh, chest, um, cardiac sound, um, you can also listen to the lung fields to see if there is any indication of an effusion, if there is any focal consolidation to suggest an infection. After you are done with doing your cardiac and your respiratory examination, go for a gastrointestinal examination. Patients who complain of lower chest pain and upper abdominal pain, you don't really want to miss a cholecystitis and a pancreatitis in them or a lower lobe pneumonia. Follow all of this up with a neurologic examination. Now, with the aortic dissection, only 16% of patients will present with a focal neurologic deficit. But when the patient has acute onset chest pain and a focal neurologic deficit on top of that, the likelihood ratio of aortic dissection is quite high. After all of these things are done, perform a general physical examination. You can check if there is any unilateral cough diameter difference, which can suggest a deep vein thrombosis which will eventually cause a pulmonary embolism. Look for pulse differences, radio-radial delays, radiofemoral delays, and carotid pulse deficits. The likelihood ratio of a patient having an acute aortic dissection while he's having chest pain and a pulse deficit is 31. That's quite high. Speaking of aortic dissection, make sure you do blood pressure differences in both upper arms of the patients. And if there is a more than 20 millimeter mercury difference, that increases your pretest probability for an acute aortic dissection. Beware though that 19% of emergency department patients will have this difference as a normal finding as well. Now that we are done with the examination, it's time to talk about the investigations that you need to carry out in a patient with chest pain. Now chest pain interests me so much because there are a handful of point of care tests that you can do, which will eventually lead you towards your ultimate diagnosis. And this is essentially just a chest x-ray, an ECG, and a point of care ultrasound if you've got the skills for it. Now this video is not going to be discussing the ECG findings that you are going to find in all of the conditions that I'm talking about. There is a separate playlist for that, and that is a completely different ballgame if I'm being honest with you. The next investigation is going to be a chest x-ray. Now I was told once by a very uh, competent physician that the chest x-ray is a physician's bread and butter. I very much think that that applies to an emergency physician as well. Let's take a look at all the findings that you can find on a chest x-ray for all the conditions that we've just mentioned. Let's take pneumothorax for instance. Easily disappearance of lung markings can point towards a pneumothorax. A deep sulcus sign will also point towards a pneumothorax. The next thing is an effusion that you can see on a chest x-ray. Focal consolidation to suggest pneumonia or in other infective conditions such as tuberculosis or different types of vasculitis. You can also take a look at changes suggestive of mediastinitis or esophageal rupture. Spillage of esophageal contents and a pneumomediastinum will point towards that. An air fluid level behind the heart can either point towards a pneumomediastinum or towards a hiatus hernia, which can be another cause of chest pain. There are some conditions such as an aortic dissection in which majority of the chest x-rays are going to be exceptionally normal. 
but there are some findings that can be detected on a chest x-ray. These are loss of aortic knuckle, a calcium sign, a left-sided diffusion being more common, and widened mediastinum more than 8.8 .8 centimeters. There is a similar case with pulmonary embolism where the chest x-ray is more or less going to be normal in majority of the cases that you see. But there are two findings that you can see on a chest x-ray which can be suggestive of a pulmonary embolism, and these are a Westermark sign and a Hampton's hump. A Westermark sign is a local oligemia in one of the lung fields, and a Hampton's hump is a triangular area of a wedge infarct that happens because of the embolus. After you're done with the chest x-ray, let's move on towards the uh, favorite test of an emergency medicine clinician, and I'm talking about the infamous D-dimers. D-dimer is a very non-specific test and it is going to be raised in a lot of other conditions apart from pulmonary embolism. It is a very good test when the patient has a low pretest probability and you can easily rule out a pulmonary embolism with the use of D-dimers. Remember that D-dimers can be age adjusted as well, so age multiplied by 10 is the specific cutoff for that particular patient when they have a pulmonary embolism. Not only does it help in the uh, exclusion of pulmonary embolism, but a D-dimers being normal also reduces the pretest probability of an acute aortic dissection as well. There are separate scores based on that, but majority of the guidelines don't recommend using the D-dimers in that particular fashion, so I would definitely recommend consulting your local guidelines before you use this approach. The next test is going to be a cardiologist's favorite test, and that is a high sensitivity troponin. I'm a huge fan of these tests because essentially what they've done is they've made all other cardiac enzymes almost obsolete. No one is using a CKMB or a myoglobin these days. In the era of high sensitivity troponins, there is an argument nowadays that there is no such thing as an unstable angina as well. And while that is a separate discussion in itself, let's talk about how we use high sensitivity troponins nowadays. High sensitivity troponins are used in such a way that we do two separate tests at at least one or two hours apart from each other. We are more interested in not a single value, but the trend of the high sensitivity troponin. It is either going up, it's staying static, or it's going down. If it is staying static, we know that this is the baseline troponin for the patient and there is no cardiac myocyte injury. When the troponin is going higher and higher and higher, that is an indicator that there is active cardiac myocyte damage ongoing. When there is a more than five point delta between the two values, that is quite significant. When there is a less than five point delta, there is a 95% accuracy rate with which you are ruling out any kind of acute coronary syndrome. When you take a two point delta between the two values, you're increasing your accuracy to around 99 to 100% in ruling out an acute coronary syndrome. There are a lot of other conditions in which a troponin is raised, and that is not only ACS, but only also in uh, pulmonary embolism and acute aortic dissection as well. It has a very important role in prognostication and predicting mortality as an inpatient as well. Uh, there is a whole other list of uh, things that are going to raise your troponin. I'm just going to throw that on the screen so you can take a screenshot of that. After all of these things are done, let's talk about a couple of things that can enhance your diagnostic testing. Now, these are a couple of scores that I wanna talk about. So the first one is your PE rule out criteria. Uh, take a look at the score and you can easily rule out a pulmonary embolism uh, in patients uh, which are low risk. There is a Wells score for pulmonary embolism or a deep vein thrombosis, which you can incorporate into your clinical decision-making. Uh, there is another score, which is aortic dissection detection risk stratification score. I'm really horrible with tongue twisters. But that kind of, uh, that score basically helps you detect whether you need to go on to further imaging or you can go on to a D-dimer. Most guidelines still don't recommend the usage of this ADDRS score, but I would, again, still uh, consult your local guidelines before using this. Of course, there is additional testing or gold standard testing that can be carried out after these initial investigations are carried out. Your pulmonary embolism is going to be diagnosed with a CT pulmonary angiogram. Your aortic dissection, you have a wide range of investigations to choose from. If you want to ask me the question as to which investigation is better, ask when you compare a transesophageal echocardiogram, a MR aortogram, or a CT aortogram, they mainly have very similar sensitivities and specificities, so um, take your pick. You can have 
an angiogram undertaken for patients who are having acute coronary syndrome in order to consider it a gold standard investigation or you can even have a CT coronary uh, angiogram to uh, take a look at those uh, arteries as well. Now we're going to end on a note and we're going to talk a little bit about the point of care ultrasound in the uh, setting of chest pain. I'm a huge fan of point of care ultrasound and I think every emergency clinician should be able to do some degree of point of care ultrasound. Um, when it comes to pneumothorax, lung ultrasound has higher sensitivities and specificities in detecting a pneumothorax as compared to a chest x-ray. You can even see regional wall motion abnormalities with a STEMI on a point of care echo. You can see other conditions such as say, consolidations, air bronchograms, effusions with the help of lung ultrasound as well. Uh, when you are performing an echo, uh, you can easily detect the presence of an aortic regurgitation murmur or a uh, widened aortic root or even a flap that is a dissection flap that is descending towards the aortic valve as well. So there are some findings uh, for each kind of condition on the point of care ultrasound that can increase your pretest probability and uh, guide you in the right direction for ultimately making the uh, right diagnosis. We're going to end this video off with one of my favorite quotes that is, keep your heads when others about you are losing theirs. So when that aorta is tearing up, keep calm and think aorta. Have a good day. That's all for today. Let me know in the comments section if this was helpful or not. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and have a good day.